quickly want to talk about some foundational principles. I thought this was important because as I was going back and I was looking at you know, exactly what do we need to do in order to not just position ourselves effectively, but also to make sure we're starting our children off correctly, right? We're starting our children off correctly. Uh, they have a good foundation, they have a firm foundation on where they're going. So many times we walk into the same financial situations that our parents walked in because uh, maybe our parents weren't really uh, knowledgeable on how to use, manage, or uh, to maximize the opportunity with their money. Uh, so therefore, uh, the children grow up in that environment and do the same thing that they have seen be done for many years in their life. And then next thing you know, they're walking in the same situation that their previous generations walked in. Now, this information and what we're talking about today is not just beneficial for what you see in um, uh, in families or in uh, you know in, in generations that do not have wealth, but you also see this same type of pattern walk in the generations of families that do have wealth. The families that have wealth, you see them carry that wealth from what one generation to the next generation to the next generation to the next generation. And so a lot of times those families are carrying those things from one generation to the next. It's because that they're actually um, they, they're actually getting their information from the previous generation. And it's showing them and giving them the mindset and the principles and the philosophy by which they live their lives. That's allowing them to, to continuously have financial increase in their lives. And then they're passing that information down from themselves to the next generation. They're passing it down from themselves to the next generation, so on and so forth. So today we want to talk about what does that principles look like? We want to talk about a few things that I think is going to be beneficial for you. Um, and that's really going to, you know, help you kind of get to where you need to be. So when we get to this next slide and we're going to go to the slideshow here uh, on this next slide. We're going to talk about uh, what we're what we're going over today. So our actual agenda for today. So let's go through some of those items on what you're going to see from an agenda standpoint. So we're going to talk about the purpose for your money. We're going to spend just a little bit of time here. Uh, most that I see on the call have been with us for some time. So you know exactly what this looks like, the primary purpose for your money. Uh, we're going to talk about owning the problem. We discussed this before as well. We're just going to do a quick recap of owning the problem. Then we're going to go into income versus wealth. And we're going to talk about income versus wealth and uh, kind of the thought process here that most of us carry when it comes to our income versus our wealth. Uh, financial philosophy. So this right here, this middle bullet right here, financial philosophy, this is the one. Like if I threw everything else out for today and the only thing that we were going to talk about was financial philosophy, that's the one that I really want you to get. That's the one that I want you to pick up on. That's the one that I want you to really take notes on as we go through, because that is going to be one that we're going to knock out the park. Um, we're going to talk about investing in yourself, which is just as important. I mean, literally, I could speak for two hours on financial philosophy, and I could speak for 10 hours probably on investing in yourself. But we didn't get that much time today, but we're going to break those down quickly, give you some quick nuggets, give you some scriptures uh, so you can continuously grow in those couple of areas. Uh, then we're going to talk about action versus inaction action versus inaction and where does the wealth usually follow uh, when it comes to action versus inaction you probably already know the answer to the question but we're going to give some very good specifics uh, around behaviors that we see in both of those categories and why that's so important and then finally we're going to have uh questions and answers so this will be an opportunity for you to ask any questions you might have and we'll kind of go through there so my intention on today is not to preach my intention today is to teach and to go through and to be detailed, take our time and make sure that you get all of the information that we have uh, so you can be um, uh, so you can be uh, armed with all of the weapons necessary in order for you to fight the fight of financial uh, poverty uh, or, you know, whatever that term that you want to use uh, when it comes to uh, the enemy and him trying to take over or defeat or defeat us in the ways of our finances. Now, I know all of you are at home and you're chilling and that's good and that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, I would love if you have the ability to be able to do so. Uh, two things I'd like for you to do if you can do so. One is 
I, uh, I want you to, if you can, I want you to come off of, uh, put your camera on so I can see you, see your face. If you are camera ready, we'd love for you to do that. Uh, if you're not, that's okay. Uh, we'll continue to do what we do. And then the second thing I'm asking of you is if you could please be active in the chat. Please be active in the chat because I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. And many times when we're doing this, what I found is it's difficult for us to bring people on live and then go back off mute, go on mute. So I'm going to ask you that you use your chat effectively because I want to ask you some questions and I would love to get some responses from you because I want this to be interactive, like a class would be, like a teaching would be. Uh, I want it to be like that and have that feel to it. So if you're able to come off camera, please do so. And if you could be active in chat, that would be such a blessing to me and everyone else that is here. All right. Okay. So let's go to work. So we're talking about um, <clears throat> the purpose for our money. Uh, so on uh, our slide, right, we're talking for the purpose of our money. Uh, that's really important to just basically everything that we do. Uh, the primary purpose for our money, uh, we know, is to make more money. That's the primary purpose. That's the primary purpose for our money is to make more money. And we got to understand that it's in that that we really put our attention and our focus. Uh, when we put our attention and our focus there, then we can really, you know, kind of take off and really go to where we want to go. The purpose of our money is not to, it's not to, it's not to, the purpose of our money is not to just spend money. The purpose of our money is to make more money. How do I position myself and get myself in a position where my money is making money for me, right? That's where a place of wealth comes from. It comes because our money is now making money for us. Now, there's many different ways by which that can take place and happen. You can start a business and your business be flourishing without you. You can put money into the stock market and now the stock market's making money for you. You can uh, invest in real estate and the uh, people are paying you a uh, monthly income that's coming into you that you're not actually working for. Uh, you can put it in a mutual fund and the mutual fund is making a certain amount of money each year uh, of money that you're not working, making or working for. And we know in Matthew chapter number 25, verse 14 through 30, we, know, we understand that God discusses and he talks about uh, the parable of the talents. And in the parable of the talents, he's discussing and going over the importance uh, behind doing something with what you've been given. And that's what God has called us to do. God's called us to do something with the finances that we have been given. Uh, and when we do that, then we start to receive from God all the things that he has and wants for us. So if we go into our slide here, you're going to see uh, that God has a wants a purpose and a plan by way of our finances. He wants us to have that. Uh, and he wants us to be able to see that. Um, and uh, there you go. If we can stay on the slide. Yeah, before me. Uh, so he wants us to be able to see that. Uh, now, when we get to that place, the first thing that we got to recognize and do is, is we've got to own the problem. Own the problem. Now, so many times people don't want to own their circumstances and their situations. They don't want to own the problem. Most families have problems when it comes to their finances. Most families have problems. You're going to see a little bit later on this deck that 74%, at least 74% of households have problems in their finances, are living paycheck to paycheck or worse, especially the numbers are even probably greater with all the things that we've seen through, by way of the pandemic. We've probably seen that number increase tremendously because of the pandemic and everything that's taking place with people losing their jobs and, and different situations and things happening. And so what, what happens is, is we get into this place where we're no longer owning the problem. We're no longer taking ownership for the situations that we're in. We are basically saying that, hey, you know, the problem is everything else and everyone else but us. But, you know, let's, let's, we got to take a look at ourselves. Now, there's situations in life that dictate certain things that happen in life. But at the same time, we have the capacity and the ability to own what's taking place and happening, or we can pawn off that responsibility to everyone else and everybody else and be satisfied with the ebb and flows of what life brings to us. But if you know the way that I know, and I know if you're attending Living Word and Worship Ministries, you know Genesis chapter one, verse 26, and God said, let them have dominion. That means rulership. That means ownership. So you cannot for one second think that you are going to change, shift, 
or be able to adjust your financial situation or help anybody else do theirs if they're not going to take the first step, which is owning the situation that they're in. If we're not owning the situation that we're in, we are going against what God has said to us in Genesis chapter one, verse 26. So we say we holy, we acceptable, we love the Lord, we're called for, by God to do what he's called us to do. Well, guess what? Then that means we gotta take ownership, not just ownership of the things that we want and desire, like, oh Lord, I'm taking ownership of this new job, I'm taking ownership of this new house, I'm taking ownership of this, this power and authority that I have. No, we've gotta also take ownership when things aren't going right. You know, we gotta take ownership when we do make mistakes. We gotta take ownership and responsibility when things don't go our way. That's the true first step to getting better at what it is that we need to do. If we don't take ownership, we'll continue to be in the same situation that we've always been in, saying the same things about everything. You say, well, what's the problem? Well, everything's the problem. Well, what's everything? Well, the government's the problem. The taxes are the problem. My family is the problem. You know, the job is the problem. The, you know, everything and everybody else is the problem. But there's one problem with all of those things that I just mentioned. You know, so many times we have a list. We have a list of problems. So, so tell me what the problem is. The problem is this, the problem is that, the problem is this. And we have this huge list of problems. I mean, think about it like this. Uh, if the problem that you have with your financial situation is taxes, is, is taxes going away? It, some, somebody just tell me, is taxes going away? This is where you get active in the chat. Is taxes going away? Is taxes going away? Let me see. No. No, taxes is not going away. So if you're waiting for taxes to go away, guess what? Your problem will never change. It'll never change. Some people say it's because of who's in the White House. You know, who's in the White House? It's because of the president. The president's the problem. Congress is the problem. Congress hasn't been getting along for the last hundred years. <laughs> If you're going to wait for Congress and for the president to get it right for you, right? It, it's not gonna happen because that's not the problem. At the end of the day, we all have to give an account. We have to look at ourselves and say, hey, what can I do to change? We've gotta recognize if we do nothing to change, then nothing around us will change. Every single year after winter, what comes? Spring, every year. I don't know, every year that I've been alive, I've been alive 42 years, and after every sin single winter that I've been alive, spring comes. After every single spring, what comes next? Summer. After every single spring, summer comes next. After every single summer, fall comes next. Why do I say that? We understand that there's going to be ups and downs and ebb and flows in life. There's gonna be times of plenty, times of harvest, times of planting there's going to be times of uh, uh of the, the winter is going to come and the winter it can be a tough time sometimes but those things don't necessarily have to dictate who you are and what your capabilities are when it comes to how you manage your finances but at first thing you got to do is you got to own the problem so regardless of what season comes into your life you are prepared for it because you understand what's happening and what's coming that's the way we need to be. So um, it's you, Ms. Tianti is right. I love it. Thank you, Ms. Tianti for giving us some, some feedback. She says, it's always easier to blame someone else than to take responsibility for our own action. You're so right. It is always easier. And here's the thing that we've got the capability of doing. We all have the capability of either doing what's necessary in order for us to get to where we need to be, but because I believe that the responsibility that we have to manage our finances effectively, wow, somebody might get upset with this, but I think it's easy. Now, you're probably saying, well, Pastor, you know, how, how are you going to tell me it's easy? It's really difficult. I've gone all this time. I haven't been able to master this thing yet. When I say it's easy, what I really mean is not that it's mentally easy, but you have the capability of doing it. And if you have the capability of doing something, then that which you have the capability of doing is easy. Because, but the problem is, is that it's easier not to do what you know you need to do. So it's easy for me to do something because I have the capability to do it, 
but it's easier for me not to do something. So therefore I take the path of least resistance. Now on this next slide, I wanna show you that there's a term that we have in the financial world that's called the locus of control. So we're owning the problem. I want you to recognize and understand that there is a locus of control. Now this term means an individual's belief system regarding the causes of his or her experiences and the reasons to which the person attributes success or failure. So that's what that means. It's why, how do you contribute success or failure? Is it based on, is your success, is your financial success based on your job and what your job has given to you or allowed you to do or based on a promotion that someone gave you? Do you feel like that it was for you to get it? Or do you feel like you've been intentional? You've worked hard. You've done the things they've asked you to do. You put yourself in the right position. And so now because of that, you've got an opportunity to do something different. See, there's two different ways that we think and that we process information. And if we process information, the direction by which everything around us is under our control, then we'll always be moving and be directed based on the way that the world is shifting around us. And how many of you know that we have a crazy world that's always shifting? And so if we have a crazy world that's always shifting around us, then we can expect our lives, especially financially to be crazy. That's what we should just expect because the crazy world that's always shifting around us. But in the same token, if we take ownership of what we are and where we are, then now we shall receive the blessing that God has for us in spite of the changing of the world that's shifting around us. That's the way that God wants us to be. God doesn't want you to be in a place where the world is controlling you. Again, go back to Genesis chapter one, verse 26. We are supposed to have dominion, rulership, authority, control, command over our lives. So if that's the case, the mindset that we must have that in good or bad, we are the owners of what takes place. Now you can't, you can't change the seasons, but you can change what you do in the seasons you can make preparation for the seasons guess what i told you after every fall comes what winter so if after every fall comes winter what should you be doing in the fall someone say preparing for the winter <laughs> you should be preparing for the winter every single uh uh you know animal understands this the bears recognize this. They understand. I'm about to go into hibernation mode. What am I going to do? Prepare. Get myself in position. Chipmunks, they understand this. They harvest all of this food. So that therefore, when the winter time comes, they've got plenty and don't have to go outside in the winter time. What preparations are you making? And are you owning the position that you're in? If you are taking ownership, then you can move on to the next step. If you're not taking ownership, then nothing else that we talk about today will matter. Nothing else is going to work. Nothing else is gonna be beneficial for you. Nothing else is going to help you get to where you wanna be financially. Now we're talking finances here, but this concept works in almost every area of your life. Almost every area of your life works in this concept. We've gotta take ownership. We gotta be on top of it, all right? So that's the benefit of taking ownership, but we will change or uh, we will expect everything around us to change, then nothing will ever change. If you don't change and you expect everything around you to change, then nothing in your life will change. All right, let me say that again. If you won't change and you're expecting everything around you to change, then nothing for you will change because your life will continuously be directed by life itself, by the things around you. But God calls us to be bold. He, takes, he calls us to take bold action. He asks us to take control of our situation. Okay, so let's move to our next one. Income versus wealth. Hmm, this is a good one here. 
We're talking about income versus wealth. Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. Make sure you take note of that scripture. Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. We already talked about this is the story of the talents. You know the story, but there's one scripture I wanted to read specifically out of this, and it says this. It says, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, this is a simple scripture. He says, you've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Very simple scripture. But let's dig here. We're talking about income versus wealth. And we're at and we're talking about why this is so vital and so important to everything that we do. So vital, so important to everything that we do. And let me tell you why it's so vital and why it's so important. It's vital and important to everything we do because we feel like at times that all I need to do is make more money. If I can just make more, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be right where I need to be. If I can just make a little bit more money, I'm gonna be exactly where I need to be. I'm gonna be able to get the things that I need to get, do the things that I need to do. God's gonna bless. I'm gonna have this increase of wealth and growth and all these things. Well, guess what? God says if you're faithful over a few things. He'll make you ruler over much. If you are foolish with a few things, then you will be foolish with a lot of things. And God is not in the business of just giving people stuff <laughs> that cannot handle it. The Bible says he will put no more on us than we could bear. Some of us could not stand to have more than what we have because we haven't figured out how to be faithful with what we have currently. So how can we now be faithful with much more? So let's go to our next slide and let me break this down for you and give you some of my key points that I have when it comes to this. All right, so I'm gonna give you some key points. This is good stuff right here. All right, so a couple key points I have for you this morning is this. So the first one is, is that when we're thinking about wealth and we're thinking about um, our paychecks, there, your income doesn't determine your wealth. Let me repeat that. Your income does not determine your wealth. Wealth is what you have available to you, right? That's what your wealth is. Your wealth is not the houses that you have or the cars that you drive that's not your wealth your wealth is what you have available money that you have available in some way shape or form funds that you have available that is your wealth that's what your wealth is so i have a quick question why do you think that most people that make more money don't necessarily have more money available I'm not talking about they don't have more stuff. I'm just talking about they don't have more money. Why is that the case? Why are people that make more money don't necessarily have more money? Just throw it in chat. Put it in the chat box for anybody that's out there. Why do people that make more money don't necessarily have more money? Any takers? Yeah. Uh, hey, I like that. As Artina said, you get more, you spend more. That's right. It says, as they make more, they spend more. Miss Tianti, you guys are on the on point. Look at the statistics that you see on the slide here. 74% of American families live paycheck to paycheck. The ranges of their income in that 74% expand from zero right, because they're not making any money at all, to 
hundred thousand dollars. Is that surprising to anyone? Is that surprising that 74% of people, even in the range of $300,000 a year of annual income, are living paycheck to paycheck? Is that surprising? I mean, think about that. Everyone in that span is living paycheck to paycheck. 74% of people that are in the page range of zero to $300,000 are living paycheck to paycheck. Absolutely crazy. Think about this. We talked about the make more, spend more, what you see on the slide. The average American family spends 13% more than they make each month. The average American family, more than 50% of families spend 13% more money than they make. Whether it's debts that they have, whether it's phones that they're paying off, whether it's cars or houses that are too big and too expensive, whether it's furniture, whether it's cable bills, I mean, spends 13% percent more money than they make. Now, so the question I have for you, how much wealth can you build if you're spending 13% more money than you make? How much wealth can you build? Someone put that in the chat. How much money can you build? How much wealth if you're spending 13% more than you make? This is not a trick question. <laughs> None. That's right. You cannot you cannot build any wealth at all because you're spending more. So what do people say? If I just make more money, I'll be okay. If I just make more, but that's not the case. When you make more, what people do is, is they spend more. If you make more money right now, what someone goes and does is they say, hey, I'm making more money, let me go buy a new car. I'm making more money, let me go get that iPhone, 13 that I want. There is no iPhone 13 yet, <laughs> but that's what they say. They make more money. They say, I, this, we're outgrowing this house. So they go get a bigger house. We do all of these things to obtain more stuff, but never having more wealth. So we got more stuff, but we don't have more wealth. Look at this second bullet point under make more, spend more. Over 40% of Americans consider themselves savers. So wait a minute. Let's do the math there. 74% of people are living paycheck to paycheck, but 40% of people consider themselves savers. You cannot be an avid saver, but yet living paycheck to paycheck. Those two things don't just mix. They don't work. So there's people that have the misperception of what they're doing, thinking of it as savings. Some people save because they wanna go on vacation. So they save for vacation. They live paycheck to paycheck, they wanna go on vacation, but by the end of the year, they've still spent all the money that they had for the previous year. And so then they look at their bank account and their bank account is no bigger than what it was the previous year. That's not what God wants. That's not dominion. That's not rulership. That's not authority. That's simply going with the ebb and flows of life. That's us not taking control over that which we have been given and positioning ourselves in a place where we could obtain a measure of wealth. And every single year, I challenge you that every single year, your measurement of wealth is greater than it was the previous year. Why? Because you're putting the necessary things in place in order to be able to get there. A hundred percent of families that start making less find a way to spend less. What does that tell you? What does that tell you that if a family starts making less, they instantly find a way to spend less? What does that tell you about our capabilities? We have the capability to spend less without making less. 
We all have the capability of doing that. It's in us, the ability is there. The question is, can we do that? Can we spend less money than what we make? And can we be intentional about that? 100% of families start making less or start spending less when they make less. The more you make also determines the more debt you're likely to have. Over 80% of people, the more money that they make, the more debt that they have. Now, why is that the case? Why is it the more that you make, the more debt that you have? Anyone want to answer that question for us? The more money you make, the more debt you have. Just go ahead, throw it in chat. Why do you think it's the case that the more money you make, the more debt you have? The more I make, the more I have. Let's see. That's it. Perfect. Ms. Artina says, the more you make, the more you're allowed to borrow. Exactly right. And so now because we have more we can borrow, guess what? We borrow more because our need and mentality for stuff is never satisfied. And if we can't satisfy our desire for more stuff, then guess what? We can never get to the place that God talks about in Matthew 25, verse 23, where he says again, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler, ruler, dominion over many things. We never get to that place where we can be ruler over many things if we never take care of and we can continuously be content with that which God is doing in our lives. If our purpose and our mindset and goal in life is to buy as much stuff as possible, then we will never have a measurement of wealth. And now we will never have what God says that a good man raises up an inheritance for his children and for his children's children. We will never have that because our goal was to get the stuff, the stuff that we cannot take with us. What we should be doing is building up an inheritance so we can give that out to the ones that come after us. And not just the money, but give them the knowledge of how to obtain and retain the money so they can now do the same for the next generation. And so now you can be a blessing, not just to your seed, but to your children's children and your children's children's children because of the knowledge and wisdom that you now impart in them that goes from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. That's why when you think of prominent wealthy families, you think about the Rockefellers, you think about the Kennedys. Why? Because they've been able to take the mindset of how to handle what they've been given and now transfer the knowledge and wisdom of what to do with what you've been given from one generation to the next generation, to the next generation, to the next generation. So what we need is not more money, we need the knowledge and discipline around that which God has given to us. If we position ourselves effectively with what God has given, then God will bless us with more. Point blank, plain and simple. More income does not necessarily lead to more wealth. The more you make, the more debt you usually take on. Some of us right now are thinking, if I just get the promotion on the job, I'm going to buy fill in the blank, right? That's the poverty mindset. The poverty mindset is, I'm making more, so therefore I have the capacity and the ability to spend more, which is go deeper in debt to satisfy my desire for more stuff. See, our problem sometimes is, is we desire the stuff more than we desire wealth. We desire the stuff more. We don't really desire to be wealthy. 
We really desire to have more stuff. And so now, because there's never a end for the amount of stuff that we desire, it just takes away from any wealth that we ever think about building. See, back in the day, we were held hostage to uh, the knowledge that we didn't have. We were held hostage to the knowledge we didn't have. We were suppressed, especially many people, especially people of color. We were suppressed. We were suppressed and we wasn't given the knowledge, the same knowledge, the same opportunities, the same understanding as everyone else. And so because of that lack of knowledge, we didn't have the ability to actually take the ownership that we could have taken because we had this lack of knowledge of what to do. In today's society in America, the knowledge is now made available. There's no more excuse for not having knowledge. So now we've got to look inside of ourselves when we go back to the beginning, owning the problem, and we got to say, what problem do I have that I'm not taking advantage of the knowledge by which I've been given? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. How do I take advantage of the knowledge that I've been given? Okay, let's move on. So I told you right here, this is, this is, this is it right here. You, you, gotta, you gotta be on point for this one. I hope you got your pads and your pins out. This is, this is it. This is the, the end all be all right here. Turn with me, Proverbs chapter 21, verse five. Proverbs chapter 21, verse five. You want to hear about the financial philosophy. I'm telling you, you got to hear about this. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5, the Bible says this, financial philosophy. He says, the plans of the diligent lead surely, surely to plenty. But those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. So let me read this again. The plans of the diligent, diligent means consistent. Plans of the diligent surely lead to plenty, but those plans, but those of everyone who is hasty, hasty, that means I'm just quick with everything I do. It leads surely to poverty. So that means I get a dollar, I spend a dollar. When I have that mindset, when I have that mentality, when that's my focus, when I get, I, I give, and I, I get it, I spend it, you know, that paycheck to paycheck, everything I come in, it goes right out. That, that mentality will never lead to it will, never, it will never lead to prosperity. So let, I want to give you some information here on financial philosophy in general. So let's talk about it. A philosophy is the rational investigation of the truths and principles of knowledge and conduct. So when we say financial philosophy, we're talking about the investigation of truths and principles and the knowledge and conduct of finances that's what we're talking about when we say we want this is a financial philosophy this is a factual proven way to if you handle your money in this fashion it is a proven way of success financial success if you can follow these financial principles and this philosophy is something that is set in your spirit, not only will it prove to be great financial success for yourself, but it will prove to be great financial success for everyone that you teach this to. Not some, I'm talking everyone. That's a strong word. I'm very careful when I use the word every because, I mean, that, that means every. But if this is your financial philosophy and you have children, grandchildren, uh, nieces, nephews, um, I'm telling you, if this is your focal point, this will be something that pushes them into a new place of financial possibilities. I'm telling you, a new place of financial possibilities. Now, I'm going to turn to this next slide here. I had some animation on those slides. Are you in presentation mode? 
Okay, can you go to presentation mode, maybe? Okay. <laughs> I'm working my wife over here. She's the best. Uh, but there's something that I don't want you to see before you see it. And so when this next slide comes up, I want just a piece of it to come up first. And so I put this in a presentation format so that way you can really see and identify uh, this philosophy. The scripture says again, let me just read it as she's pulling that up for us. It says, the plans of the diligent surely lead to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty, everyone that's hasty, surely leads to poverty. You go into presentation, they can see everything that you got on your screen. <laughs> surely lead to poverty. Okay, she's not able to pull it up. All right, well, we'll pull the whole slide up. Just, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. All right, so here we go. So let's go to the, to the next one. Just click for me one time. So our financial philosophy is this, and you've heard this term before. Pay yourself first. But I want to give you a new meaning to this because usually when we talk about finances, especially in the church, can we be real church folks? When we talk about money in the church, what do we always say? We always say we got to pay God first, right? And, and we're exactly right at that. It says give and it shall come back to you. Good measure, press down, shaking together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. I understand that. Just hang with me here. I'm not saying that you don't pay God first. I'm not saying that you don't take your tithes and offer off the top. That's not what I'm saying. We're going to get to that, but I want to give you a complete financial philosophy that includes you because we've talked about, especially in ministry, we've talked about how it's so important in order for you to pay God first. And we say, pay God first, pay God first, pay God first. And we go through the scriptures of giving and giving and giving. And all of that is important. All of that is necessary. And I agree with all of that 1000%. But what we don't teach, what we don't teach because we stop right there we don't teach what do we do next what do we do after i've given to god what's next on my list what should i be doing with what i get what is what should my own personal financial philosophy outside of giving to god my 10 percent or the tenth that he's asked for what should that be when i'm a child and, and you know when i was a child I, I mean, I remember going to uh, my, I, I'd go to my great grandma's house. And my great grandma, she used to live in this little small house, but beside this tobacco field. And I'd go to my great grandma's house and uh, she, you know, we would be there and she, you know, she'd always cook because that was her thing, right? She would just throw down. She'd have this big, huge meal that we would eat and we would take advantage of. It was awesome. And there'd be a moment in time where either my great grandmother or I remember uh, my grandfather, they, they would give me a dollar. And when they would pull that, that dollar out of their pocket, man, it was like, it was the greatest thing in the world. As a child, you was just like, oh my goodness, I'm about to get some money. And my eyes would light up and I'd get so excited and so happy. And I'm telling you, I'd be begging my mom before we got to the highway to stop at Wayson's Corner and pick up some sunflower seeds or something to drink. Like before I got to the house, <laughs> that dollar was probably gone, right? It was probably gone. And the reason why it was gone, because at a young age, we never was taught this financial philosophy that if you start teaching your kids from the time that they get their first dollar in their pocket, you can start to build a behavior that will take them to financial success throughout their entire life because of this philosophy that you are inputting into their spirit, that you are not letting them get a dollar from somebody, from their family member or whoever it might be, without now instituting instantly this financial philosophy. Because if you get this built in them at the young age, the Bible says, 
train up a child in the way that he shall go, right? Am I, am I right about that? He says, train up a child in the way that he should go. So when he gets old, he will not depart from it. So if we teach the financial philosophy and principles when they get their first dollar, then that means when they get $10, they'll use the same financial philosophy. When they get $20 and $100 and $1,000 and $100,000 and $10 million, it'll be the same financial philosophy that will allow them to grow at every aspect of their lives. And that's what God wants us to see. You've got to not just give. Giving is important. Giving is fundamental. If you don't give, the Bible says you'll be cursed with a curse. All that is true. But now you've got to go into a new philosophy on what to do after the giving takes place. We, as the body of Christ, as the church, must now give people more than just to say give, 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 give to the Lord. Okay, well, what do I do with everything that's left? If I don't have a financial philosophy for that, then guess what? I will never do what I need to do with what's left. But hit me again. On the next one, we're going to talk about what that philosophy needs to be. So this is where I want you to pay attention. So we say right there, stay right there. The first thing we got to do is, is we're going to give. So the giving comes off the top. The same way that God has talked about giving, the giving is going to come off the top. It's going to be the most important thing for us. We're going to make sure that we give God what's God's because God owns everything that we have. We're going to be faithful to what God has said because we know that's where the blessing comes from. We know that's where the increase comes from. We know that's where the favor comes from. In order for us to get to a place of wealth, we've got to be faithful at giving. So that is true, and we're sticking to it. But when we get down to our second principle here, and the principle is, uh, is something that leads and guides our action, and the actions guide our outcomes. So the principle leads to our actions. So if I got this principle of giving 10% of everything that I get, the principle leads to my action of actually giving. And then the action actually leads to the outcome, which God says, now because I've given, it shall come back to you. So the principle leads to the action. The action leads to the outcome. So now the second action or the second principle that you must put in place, 10%, that means only 10 cents of your dollar, God says give. Number two, 10 cents of your dollar you now save. And 10 cents of your dollar you now invest now let me tell you why these three things here are some of the most fundamental foundational principles that you could ever use yourself and teach to somebody else number one you already understand that one if we don't give if we're not faithful to what god has said then guess what the bible says you'll be cursed with a curse and so I'm not messing with God. So do that. Number two, savings, 10%. Think back in your recesses if you were saving 10% of everything that you made last year. How much income would you have? Think, I'm not, I'm not talking about interest being included. I'm not talking about any additional finances and money. I'm just saying if you just saved 10% of everything you had, how much would you have? Just think if you save 10% of everything that you've made for the last two years, how much would you have? Think about how much you would have if you had 10% of all the money that you made over the past three or four or five or 10 years of time. I just want you to do the mental math and say, how much would you have? Think about it like this. If you save, 10% of your income for 10 years, you will have a whole year's worth of income accumulated. And I'm not talking about interest. I'm not talking about putting in the stock market. I'm not talking about investing right now. I'm just simply talking about you saving 10% of everything that you made over a 10 year time frame and you took it and you put it in your mattress, you would have one full year's worth of income in your mattress. Now, I don't recommend you putting it in your mattress, 
But I'm just saying, you'd have a whole year's worth of income just if you save. Now, I wanna tell you the importance behind the savings because the importance behind the giving is because it belongs to God and we already know about that. The importance behind the saving is the protection for a rainy day. Savings is funds and income that you have available that's been made available to you by way of money that you are bringing in from some stream that you have that gives you the capability to now have funds available for the winter. When the winter comes, I've got money available. How many people went through a winter in 2020? How many people? Oh, everybody went through some sort of winter. Everyone went through some sort of winter in 2020. 2020 shook all of us in some way, shape, or form. But guess what? Financially, if you're not prepared for the winter, then now you are like the chipmunk that did not store up anything for the season that he knew was coming. Don't be excited about coming out of 2020 and thinking that a winter is still not on the horizon. Another winter will come in some way, shape or form. It might not be the same way that it came in 2020. It might be a winter that only affects you. What have you stored up? What have you saved up? What have you positioned? If you can get a child to understand, if I get a dollar, 10 cents of that goes to God, 10 cents of that goes to savings. Imagine, imagine if they live their entire life from the very beginning with that financial philosophy in giving 10, saving 10. The savings, the Bible says that money is a defense. It's a defensive weapon. Ecclesiastes, some people say Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Verse uh, chapter seven, verse twelve. It's not on my chart here, but Ecclesiastes chap verse or chapter seven, verse twelve. It says this. He says, "For wisdom is a defense. That means doing what's right by which God has given me." He says, "As money is a defense. Why is money a defense? Has anybody ever has anybody ever had an argument over money with somebody? Anybody? Has anybody ever ever had an argument over money?" No, y'all ain't had no arguments over money? Yes? There's been some argument. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm in the right crowd here. Yes? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. <laughs> yes. There's been people that have had arguments about money. Yes, we have arguments about money. The Bible says money is a defense. It's a defense. It protects us. It says wisdom is a defense as money is a defense. He says this, though. But the excellence of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to those who have it. So he says, wisdom is a defense, money is a defense, but if you take wisdom and you match it with money, guess what? Now you got an offense. Now it's no longer you just being on the defensive. He says, you take the defense of wisdom, the defense of money, and now that gives you an offensive weapon, which you have the resources to use that what you have the most effectively. But you cannot win with money or in your finances if you're not first thinking that I give 10 to God, I take 10, and now I'm storing this 10 up. You, if you've been working at your job for longer than 10 years, this philosophy right here would tell me that you'd have at least one full year of income saved up in your account. One full year worth of income saved up in your account because you are taking the principles that God has given and you're using them on your behalf. The first 10 cents you give, the second 10 cents you save. Now, let's talk about this third 10 cents because the second 10 cents is for a rainy day. If something happens, if something comes up, guess what you've got to fall back on? You've got that second 10 cents, that savings. That's why it's there. Then the third 10 cents is investing. Now, some of us don't talk about this investing thing, but we got to talk about it. 
There is a whole arena. There are so many people that are so frustrated and so angry about people making money on Wall Street or on investments and all these other things. Are you kidding me? It's a system and a tool and a resource that's available. Why get upset at the tool and the resource that's available? Most get mad and upset at the tool and the resource that's available because they're not taking advantage of the tool and the resource that's available. Come on. It's a tool and a resource that's available to each of us to invest. So I'm, again, let's simplify this to the dollar that you see on the screen. We take the dollar, 10 cents, we give. 10 cents, we save. 10 cents, we invest. Why am I investing? I'm investing to build additional growth outside of my own capability. See, investing means I'm making money come in to my situation that I am physically not working for. I am making money come into my situation that I am not physically working for. If you go to job, if you go to your job, guess what? No matter how much money you're making, you are physically putting the time, the effort and energy in in order to make that money. Regardless of that, you get you, you getting paid by the hour, regardless if that's a salary that they're paying you, you must continue to do that job in order for you to make that money. When you invest, you are putting money into another avenue that allows you to make money that's outside of your own personal blood, sweat, and tears. I just want you to sit on that for a second. When you invest, you are putting money in another area of income for you to increase outside of your own blood, sweat, and tears. Now, some people might say this, well, Pastor Glover, you understand. I could put my money in there and I could lose everything. It's risky. Well, I mean, life is risky. I mean, waking up is risky. Driving your car is risky. Flying on an airplane is risky. At this time, even breathing is risky. Matter of fact, life is so risky, none of us will make it out alive. We're not gonna make it out. That's how risky it is. So you can sit on the sideline and do nothing, or you can get in the game. Now I'm saying, you gotta use wisdom when you get in the game. I just wouldn't just do whatever. But what I am saying is you got to be in the game in order to win the game. And if you're not in the game, don't get mad at the people that's in the game and that's winning in the game. Don't get mad at them, folks. Don't get upset just because there's other people that's in the game and winning the game, but you don't want to get in the game. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, maybe that's what you want to do. I'm not talking about, you know, just throwing your money at something, get rich, quit. Thing. No, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sound investments in beneficial organizations that have a future of growth in some way, shape, or form. And you can determine what that is. I got some ideas of what that could be, but that's not what this call is about this morning. But guess what? You had an opportunity to make those decisions, make those choices. And if you want help with that, I'm definitely willing to help you. Or I'm sure other people are willing to help you. We got financial professionals that are willing to help and help people do that. But what I'm saying is you've got to teach your children to take 10 cents and get in the game. Get in the game. If they get in the game with giving, God's going to bless. If they get in the game with saving, they got a defense. If they get in the game with investment, they've got something for the future that they can always fall back on. So if the brakes fall off of everything in their life, they've got tons stored up. Why? Because they are following this simple financial principle of paying yourself first.
I'm giving to God, I'm saving, and I'm investing. Now, guess what? Go ahead, hit the next one. With the next one, guess what you got left available? 70% of your income is now available. You can spend 70%. It's there, it's available for you. When you get the new, if you start this with the first job, and you're living in this relationship with the first job. When you get the, the next one, the income increase, guess what? The same philosophy will apply. You get the next increase in your job, the same philosophy applies. You get the next increase in your job, the same philosophy applies. Guess what? I, once you start to grow and continuously grow yourself and you keep using this philosophy, what we talked about as far as having uh, a one year worth of income saved up after 10 years, man, you have way more than one year worth of income saved up after 10 years. You got investments that are bringing you in, continuously growing more money than maybe what you're making at some point in your life. Now, instead of you sit spending 70%, you're making so much money that you're only spending maybe 50%. Maybe you're only spending 40% because the amount of increase in income that you have that's coming in because of your diligence that the Bible says of doing that, which he's called you to do, now is moving you into a place of so much wealth that it would be ridiculous for you to spend it all. Now you're helping somebody else invest. You're investing in someone else. You're giving to someone else. You're a blessing to someone else. Your blessing now starts to extend beyond the realm of even your own family because God has blessed you so much so that you have so much more to be able to give and to provide for. But see, I, my giving comes with a price. When I give, I want to give the philosophy. I want to give the understanding because if you can teach someone how to do what you've done, now, guess what? The, the, the range of the benefit that you have of that person extends beyond them and extends to other people that they can now sow that same philosophy in too. God wants us to not just give and then stop. That's not what he said. We've got to start teaching the complete cycle of the financial uh, realm so that people understand what should I do next? It's not okay for you to give. This Pastor Glover is saying it right now. It's not okay for you to give 10% of your money and then spend the other 90%. It is not okay. That is not what God has taught. That is not what God is saying. That is not what God has planned for us because we can never achieve the wealth that God says is ours if we are going to give him 10 and spend 90%. We'll never get it. And so you can sit back and ask God for all these things and all these things and God do all this and do all that all you want, but you will never truly receive that which God really wants you to have if you are sitting back waiting for God to give you something. Now, why? You look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 18, I believe is the scripture. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, 18, uh, man, let me get that real quick because I want to read it to you right. Um, let, me, let me show you what he says in 8.18. In Deuteronomy 8.18, he says this, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power or the ability to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. God did not say that he's going to give you wealth. What did he say? He said, I'll give you the power to get wealth. God doesn't want to work outside of you. God wants to work through you. He says, I give you the power. I'll give you the power to get wealth. That's what we're looking for. If we're just expecting God to give it to us, guess what? We're going to be sitting back, not doing anything. I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm 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 waiting. They that wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. No, you got to stop sitting back and waiting for God to do outside of you. You got to allow God to work through you. That's where the waiting comes. The waiting comes because I'm actively doing that which God has said. 
And so therefore I'm waiting for the reward to happen in the midst of my action. It's the difference between, there's a difference between waiting on getting to a destination that you never get in the car to go to. What's gonna happen? You will never get there. But if you're waiting as you're driving to the destination, it's just a matter of time before I get there. That's the difference in the waiting. I'm not waiting and doing nothing and not following the financial philosophy that God has given us and outlined for us. I'm waiting as I'm moving towards where God says I'm going to get to. So you might not be a millionaire yet, but because you are waiting and following the philosophy, millionaire status is on the way. This past month, we was able to pay off our mortgage on our house. Why? Not because we was waiting for something and just sitting back waiting for it to happen. We was actively moving towards it faster and faster and faster and faster. And then now finally, after 10 years of being intentional about getting to this place, God allowed us to get to this place and achieve the success that we had been looking for and desiring because of our activity moving us in the direction that God's called us to go. That's what you got to have, a passion and desire to move towards where God has called you to, have a, a financial philosophy that's firm and founded in the word of God that is now telling us to be diligent and not sitting back waiting for something to happen. Man, I said I wasn't going to preach, but I got excited. I'm sorry. But that's what God wants for us. Think about your child. 10% give, 10% save, 10% invest. When my children get birthday money, 10% give, 10% save, 10% invest. If auntie or your uncle give something, 10% give, 10% save, 10% invest. If you find $20 in a bathroom, rest uh, uh, in a bathroom, 10% give, 10% save, 10% invest. Wherever it comes from, what do you got to do? 10% give, 10% save, 10% invest. A financial breakthrough that can change everything. Okay, I told y'all that one was gonna be good. Okay, let's go to the next one. We got just a couple more. We're gonna end at 11.30, so just hang on with me a couple more minutes. Oh God, this one's good. You gotta invest in yourself. All right, let's hit the next one, go to the scripture. You gotta invest in yourself. We already talked about Deuteronomy 8.18, right? We talked about that one, let's keep it right there. We talked about it because this is important. You have to invest in you. The greatest investment that you can make is in yourself. If you only make $10,000 a year, you can't save any more than $10,000. It's not possible. That's 100% of your savings, 10,000. If you want to be a millionaire, it's not necessarily, you don't become a millionaire because of the money that you save. You become a millionaire because of who you become. Let me repeat that. You don't become a millionaire because of the money that you have saved. You become a millionaire because of who you have become. See, people want to win the lottery so badly because they don't want to put the work in necessary for them to become a millionaire. And you don't become a millionaire because of what you say. You become a millionaire because of how you've invested and developed yourself. The best investment that you can make is in yourself. So think about it like this. Some of us say, well, uh, Pastor, I make $10 an hour, or I make $15 an hour, or I make $20 an hour. What, maybe I make a salary of $50,000 or $60,000 or $70,000 a year. Why do you make the, as much money as you make? Why? Why do you make as much money as you make a year or an hour 
Why is that the case? Does anybody want to try to answer that one? Why do you make as much money as you make at your job? Anybody want to take a stab at that in the chat box? Why do you want to make, why do you make as much as you make? Simple question. Why do you make as much as you make? That's how, because maybe that's how much you negotiated to make. Maybe that's how much they offered you to make. <laughs> maybe that, that's how much they said the job was. All of those are the right answers, right? So, uh, my auntie says, uh, because of the type of work that you do, absolutely, that's a, that's a great, that's a great uh, answer. And this is kind of a trick question. I've kind of coached you into this trick answer here. But the reason why you make the amount of money that you make is because that is the value that the marketplace has for you. Is it possible for you to make more money than you're making right now? Is it possible? The answer is yes, it's possible. It is possible for you to make more than what you're making right now. It's possible. But the only way that you make more than you're making right now is if you become more valuable to the marketplace. How do I become more valuable to the marketplace? Because I'm investing in myself. I'm working harder on myself than I am on my job. See, if you work hard on your job, you have a career. If you work hard on yourself, you have a fortune because you become more valuable. If I become more valuable to my job, my job will pay me more. If I become more valuable to my job, guess what? Another job will pay me more. Why? Because I've become valuable to my entire market. And guess what? If I become so valuable that my job will give me more money just to keep me there because they understand the value that I, me personally, physically bring to this situation. So each of us, regardless of how much we make now, we've got the ability to make more because we can become more valuable. So if we're only working for the job, then we'll only be as valuable as the job says we are. But if we work on ourselves, we develop ourselves, we become better, we grow ourselves, we get more knowledge, we get more information, we get more understanding, we master the expertise in the area that God has called us to. Now, guess what? Instead of us getting paid for what we do, you start to get paid for what you know. You start to get paid for what you know. People will start to call you and say, listen, I just need some help in this. And that's, what, that's why they have all these consultants out there. But you can't be a consultant if you haven't mastered something. Think about it like this. Some people just get paid just for their knowledge. If I called up John Maxwell right now and said, hey, I need some time with you to talk about leadership. Guess what John would say? Absolutely. It will cost you. <laughs> why? Because he's mastered it. So now he, he's, he's a consultant. He consults people. It's not even that he's working any longer. Now people just want his information that's in his brain, in his mind, so they can become better. When you start to master something and you invest in yourself and you work on yourself, now you get to a place where people desire what's on the inside of you. And so now it's your mind that's making your money and not your hands. And that's the perfect place as we get older. And guess what? Our bodies start to get a little bit weaker. We start to slow down a little bit. But guess what you still got? Everything that you got up here. And because of all the stuff that you've mastered and you've grown and you've developed over the years, now people pay you for what you know. Because that's what they do. That's what a counselor does. Why do we pay a psychiatrist? Because of what they know. Why do we pay a doctor to come in and tell us what they think? Because of how much they've invested in themselves, going to college all those years, learning all of what they learned. And so now, because of what they've invested in themselves, we trust them and pay them big money. We go to the dentist so the dentist can take a look. Oh, yeah, it looks like, you know, everything's good. And guess what? You pay the dentist. Regardless if you got cavities or not. <laughs> because you're paying for the investment 
that they've made in themselves all those years. Let's go. You want to go deeper? Let's talk about Jesus. Listen, I think it's in Isaiah. Come on, somebody help me out. Isaiah chapter 9. Am I, is that where I need to go? Isaiah chapter 9. Yes. Listen to this. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Listen to this. I'm telling you, God, the word, the word is off the chain. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he says this. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Who is he talking about? Somebody put in the chat who he's talking about. Isaiah chapter 6, who are we talking about? Isaiah chapter 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Jesus, yes, that's right. That's who we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus. He says, and the government will be upon his shoulders, right? Now look at what he says. He says, and his name will be called. What's the first name? Wonderful. All right. So that's the first name. What's the second name? Counselor. Oh my God. I want you to get this. A consultant is nothing more. The, the word consultant means counselor. <laughs> Jesus was a consultant. Jesus was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not because of what he did with his hands. Oh, my God, boy, I hope y'all shouting at the house. But he was a counselor for what he knew. That's why Jesus was a king. That's why Jesus came with all power. That's why Jesus had all authority. He was counselor because of his knowledge of the deep things that the Bible says of God and only the spirit had access to. And Jesus was full of the spirit. And so that's what people was connected to. They were connected to who, what Jesus knew. When you invest in yourself, the favor and the blessing, and people will start coming to you, asking for your expertise in areas of the place where you've invested in yourself. My God. And when you invest in yourself, then the blessing and favor and all the other things that you need shall come to you. The tree never gives its fruit to the people. The people always go to the tree to pick it. And God wants the same for you. If we are to be Christ-like, we are to be counselor, consultant, just like Jesus. Man, oh man, I'm supposed to be teaching. I got seven minutes. Y'all done messed up. Okay. So we've got to invest in ourselves. That's why the philosophy that we just went over, the 10, 10, 10, and 70 is so important. If you don't invest in yourself, then you shouldn't expect anybody else to invest in you. Now that might hurt, but it's true. If you don't invest in yourself, don't expect anybody else to invest in you. Don't expect it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Go ahead, hit that button. We almost done. I got seven minutes, six and a half. All right, so now we're talking about action versus inaction. Action versus inaction. All right, go ahead, hit me again. And I got two scriptures that go along with this one, I believe. I think I got two scriptures. Galatians 6, 7. So write that down, Galatians 6, 7. I want you to get this. I want you to get the fruits of what we're talking about. Galatians 6, 7 says this. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. All right? So whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. All right? You can take the VMAX and put camera up there. Because we already see the slide down there. So that whatever a man sows, he also reaps. This is very important. There are people that are not sowing any seeds in the spring. They're not sowing any seeds in the spring. And they're going into fall. Looking for a harvest. God does not say the ones that reap or harvest are the ones that are in need. He 
He doesn't say the ones that get the harvest are the ones that are in need. He doesn't say the ones that get the harvest are the ones that are in need. <laughs> he says the ones that get the harvest are the ones that sow. If you don't plant no seeds in the back, don't go into the fall expecting a harvest. If you're not going to follow the financial philosophy, don't expect your bank account to get any bigger. If you're not going to follow what God has said, don't expect the blessings of the Lord to make it rich and add it no sorrow. If you're not going to do the simple things of investing in yourself and getting better, don't expect the promotion. Don't expect increase of income. Don't expect the next job to pay you more. Don't expect yourself to be more valuable in the marketplace if you're not willing to sow. There's too many of us that are out there. We're looking and we're praying. <clears throat> we're praying for a harvest. 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 But we are not sowing. And it is shameful for you to pray that God give you a harvest and you ain't sowing nothing because now he would be doing something that's outside of what he said in his word. Because his word say that for he who sows to his flesh will reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will reap everlasting life. God wants us to sow. So you've got to sow. You've got to put the work into the spring. Spring is a time of opportunity. When opportunity comes, you've got to plant. You've got to be on it. And then guess what? Not only do you plant, but let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, he says this. He says, the hardworking farmer must be the first to partake of the crop, of the crops must be the first why because it's the farmer that's been working the crop that's why the farmer take partakes first because he's been working it so if i sow in the springtime you gotta work that thing during the summer why i gotta work it during the summer because in the summer the sun comes out and tries to burn up the crop in the summer the bugs come out and try to eat up the crop in the summer guess what if i'm not watering it then the crop is going to die because it gets too dry in the summer, I need to put shade sometimes on it, put it in the right position. I've got to work it in the summer so when the fall comes, the crop is as big as that can be because the crop will grow to its fullest potential based on the environment that it's placed in. And so if you put your seeds in the right soil and in the right environment, you're guaranteed to get a harvest. You don't even have to pray. Oh, God, that might be too much for somebody. That might be too much. You don't even have to pray for a harvest. I don't have to pray for a harvest if I'm following the principles for a harvest. My God, I ain't got to pray for a miracle if I'm following the principles. If I'm planting the seed in the springtime, if I'm taking care of my harvest in the summertime, I have the right to go to the fall and to get the harvest. I have a right to that. It's not, you know, no, it's not outside of me. It's in me. God's given me the ability to obtain wealth. He's given me the power to obtain wealth. What will you do with what God has given you? I didn't even know that was going to rhyme. That sounded good. <laughs> My wife's laughing at me. Right? What are you going to do with what God's given you? Plant your seeds. Take care of your seeds. And then you shall get your harvest. I've seen it in my life, and I believe God will bring it to your life as well. So you got to invest in yourself. You've got to bring forth that harvest. And let's go to our next slide here. I got this last slide. I know I'm at 11:30. Just give me two more minutes. So here's this. So the question is: who are you? Who are you? Are you a man or a woman of action? Or are you a man and a woman? Don't do it on that one. Just do it on this one over here for me. Are you a man or a woman of inaction? Right? Which one? Which one are you? 
All right, so hit the button here. Let's talk about a man or woman of action. This man or woman of action, this is, this is who you are. Always moving forward. I'm not turning around. It might be raining. It might be snowing. I might have difficulty around me. I might have hurdles in front of me. I might have roadblocks, but I'm always moving forward. When you're a person of action, you control each situation. I can control the situation. I know God said he's given me the power. He's given me authority, and I've got dominion over it. I'm going to command to the mountain that it be moved and cast into the sea. You invest in yourself. I got to grow. I got to become stronger. I got to read my word. I got to find out what God has said. I got to take action. I got to master something. You fail fast. Yes, man, that thing didn't work. I, I, you know, I, I thought that's what God was telling me to do, but guess what? He, it wasn't. I'm stopping that. I'm not doing that. And I know that's not working anymore. I'm going to move and I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to keep failing in something and I know it's not working. When you're a person of action, you're diligent and consistent. That means I'm not going to stop the process. I'm going to give my 10. I'm going to give my 10. I'm going to give my 10. And then I spend my 70. I'm going to stay with that because I know that's the philosophy. That's the financial mindset that's necessary to win. You plant seeds. I'm going to keep planting seeds and keep planting seeds and keep planting seeds because I know if I plant enough seeds, I'm going to keep getting a harvest. See, that's a person of action. Taking control, ownership. But of inaction. This is who you are when you're of inaction. A person of inaction depends on others. They depend on other people. They wait for opportunity. They wait for of opportunity to find them. They wait for opportunity to find them. I, I put that one in wrong. They wait for opportunity. They wait for opportunity to find them. They don't try to go out and create opportunity. They're not about planting seeds. They want to walk into a harvest that's, oh, that's, that's just ready for them to pick. Matter of fact, they want to walk on somebody else's harvest because they didn't put the work in to get it, but they still want the harvest. They dependent, dependent on other people, dependent. So not just depends on others, but they're actually dependent on others, which means they don't have the capacity to do anything outside of themselves. Everything that must be done, it must be someone else that blesses them. They're sitting back. They're waiting for things to happen. People of inaction have tons of excuses. It's the government's fault. It's the taxes' fault. It's my friend's fault. It's my family that don't believe in me and won't help me out and won't provide for me, won't give me anything. It's the neighbors that won't bar, let, allow me to borrow any money. It's everybody else's fault but themselves. They have a sense of entitlement. <laughs> they have a sense of entitlement. The sense of entitlement. Oh, yes, entitlement. I should just, people should just give me stuff because I'm me. I mean, I mean, look, when I walk out the door, people should just be showering me with blessings and favor, just because of who I am. I'm entitled to it, right? I shouldn't have to work for it. They owe me. People that have this type of mindset expects a harvest without planting seed. People of inaction expect a harvest without planting seed. They expect a harvest without planting seed. Yeah, they expect it. They expect the harvest to come. They just, you know, they have this thought process that I'm just supposed to just receive without, you know, without planting anything. I should just get it. It's mine. But that's not how it works. We've got to be a people of action and not of inaction. We can't be sitting back waiting. Oh, the them, I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait, and God going to bless me. God's going to bless me. I'm going to wait, and he's going to bless me. No, 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 to the no, to the no, 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 no. That's not how it works. 
That's not how it works. The blessing comes because of the actions that we take. Uh, Deuteronomy 8.18, God gives us the ability to obtain wealth. The ability, that means he wants to work through you and in you, not outside of you. He wants to work in you, through you, not outside of you. And so if we allow God to manifest his presence in himself through us, then we shall receive everything that is ours. Everything that's ours. So it's 1136. I've gone over my time. But I want to give you some time. If you do have any questions, I want to give you some time to ask some questions. So you can uh, text your questions in the, in the chat box or you can come off mute, ask questions, whichever way you want to do that, feel free to do that. We recorded this today, didn't we? we recorded, okay. All right, I see Brother Juan is out on the line. What's going on, sir? Are you blessed? Man, well, we started at 1030 Eastern time. <laughs> but that's okay, that's okay though, because we recorded this. So we're gonna make sure you get the recording, okay? We're going to make sure we send you the recording so you and the fam got it. Um, anybody? Anybody got any questions, though? Any questions? The ball's in your court. The question is how are you going to respond? The ball's in your court. Any questions? 